What's going on everyone and welcome to Method in the Madness. This is the podcast that not only delves deep into design and creativity, but also leadership, productivity and personal development. And this is episode 22 and my next guest is a gentleman called Simon Coley, who is the director and co-founder of Karma Drinks, a fantastic soft drinks brand. And Simon and I were introduced through another guest called uh, Chris from Keep Cup, who appeared on the show last year. So we both decided to make good use of our lockdown life and get this episode recorded. Episode was a lot of fun. Simon is a total legend, sharing some incredible stories about the origination of Karma Drinks and their purpose, visiting Sierra Leone for the first time, and he was also pretty candid about some of the turbulent times that they're currently facing with the COVID-19 crisis. So don't worry, you won't be disappointed. And this episode of the podcast is brought to you by iZettle's Forever Local Project. As many of you know, I now work at iZettle and during these difficult times, they have started a fantastic initiative which I asked if I could promote on the show. So, iZettle have always been a champion of local businesses and believe that these businesses are the heart and soul of the local community. That's why they have launched a new website called Forever Local. Forever Local connects local communities with independent businesses and the communities around them. Through Forever Local website, you're able to search and discover businesses local to you, helping you support the community around you during these tough times. And if you are a local business yourself, you can use the website to tell potential customers how they can support your business during these difficult times, whether it's in-store, online, or even through a new delivery service you may be offering. So whether you're looking to discover and support the local businesses in your area, or you are a business owner supporting the people in your community, then you should definitely check out iZettlesForeverLocal.com. That's F-O-R-E-V-E-R-L-O-C-L-A.com, ForeverLocal.com. It's a fantastic initiative, so check it out today and help support local businesses near you. Now, without much further ado, please welcome Simon Coley to Method in the Madness. Simon, thank you very much for coming on the show. Uh, how is lockdown life treating you? Well, today it's sunny, so I, you know, obviously a lot more up to optimistic when I can see outside and see the park that's across the estate where we live. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's it's unusual, but not all terrible. Yeah. Uh, this uh, episode's kind of been in the making for a while because we've been trying to arrange it for quite some time, but I really appreciate you taking the time to come on the show, so thank you. Oh, no, I really appreciate it, and it's given me an excuse to go back through some of the shows. So listening to people like Aaron Drapeman has been kind of a good vibe for the day. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Sunny weather, Aaron Drapeman's dulcet yeah. tones. What else? <laughs> what else could you need? We were uh, introduced to one another by another guest, Chris Baker, who was on the show. Um, and prior to that, I had, I had heard of Karma Cola, but I had never actually honestly tasted any of your products which i have recently thanks to uh andrew dobie's made brave launch party which oh, was serving a, yeah. a whole bunch of cocktails with gingerella and lemonade 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 and all sorts so that was awesome you um, sort of like us kiwis you all know each other yeah <laughs> yeah uh, uh, andrew's great and well man he awesome. certainly knows how, knows how to throw a party as well fucking hell well, i wish i got up for that and uh when this is all over i definitely will yeah, yeah, his new the new digs are something to be admired. That's for certain. He's been a prolific poster during this time. I'm really impressed with his output at the moment. There's so much creativity considering. Yeah, stuck at home. Yeah, he's like a kid in a candy store. Um, really enthusiastic guy. Love that guy. Um, but yeah, prior to uh coming, like I didn't really know much about the story and purpose behind Carmichael. I had seen it in you know shelves of eateries and things like that, but. Could you tell us a little bit about what kind of Karma Cola is all about and how you got started? Well, I mean, it's interesting that you say you'd seen it because it's, it's a big part of the thing that I really kind of take pride in is that people, when people see it, they notice it and hopefully remember it. That, you know, a big point of the way we engage with, <clears throat> with people is to try and get them to notice our labels. Uh, you know, when you're trying to take on a, a pretty big market that has 
plenty of choices. Getting people's attention just through their eyeballs is a pretty good way to start. Yeah, absolutely. And it's kind of where I started. Like I used to sweep the floors of a printing press in Christchurch, New Zealand as a kid and always loved the spell of printer's ink and the idea of being a designer or a you know, printer. And, uh, you know, my kind of skills develop there. And not that I do all these designs. We have some amazing artists that work with us, but it's always been, you know, a really uh, exciting part of the of the whole mix. And, you know, although it's just soft drinks, we do do uh, quite a bit to try and make them relevant and interesting and, and do kind of fulfill that mission of ours, the karma in our name, to make sure that the people that produce all the ingredients do well out of it too. And that's kind of where the idea started, that we, my business partners, Chris and Matt Morrison and I, were at that stage and we were thinking what we would do next um, in our lives. And we had this idea that we could start a company that would have that sort of virtuous intent of making food and drink that would be great for the land that it was grown, the ingredients were grown, the, the people who grew them and the, the people who, who consumed them. And the idea turned into a company we called All Good, which was, you know, the good to the power of three thing that we would make it good for the planet, the people and and ourselves, or people mm. consuming. Um, it seemed a really obvious way to do it. But, you know, the first complexity was just actually sourcing ingredients. And fortunately, Chris is amazing at finding organic produce. And we had enough experience within the team to be able to start looking for products and you know one of the first things we did was was uh, bringing uh, fresh tropical fruit from Samoa to New Zealand thinking we could support our Pacific neighbors economies by bringing what was great organic produce from there back home that went reasonably well um, but we did learn that we didn't know a lot about perishable goods and we're probably compelled to try and figure out how to make them <laughs> have a longer shelf life <laughs> and that led to the colder thing when we we're going well in naming that idea, the, the kind of we were looking at bringing coconuts and chocolate and coffee from the islands, and I'd been thinking maybe a preface for all of those products of karma would explain the relationship between the producers and consumers, and that that's quite quite a tidy way to to differentiate us and, and explain the you know why we were doing it. Yeah, so we're thinking I was thinking oh karma coconut sounds good karma. Coffee, you know, that sounds pretty good. But then out of that popped Karma Cola. I thought, wow, <laughs> I wonder where Cola comes from. And we were lucky enough to be uh, visited by a woman called Harriet Lamb, who was then the the, uh, the CEO of Fair Trade International. And oh wow, she was she came out to help us with our banana business. It's all good business. And she said, oh, I will talk to her dinner after she had done a talk with us and i asked her did you do you know anyone or do is there such a thing as like a fair trade cola we've been doing a bit of research and trying to see if we could find some and she said you know there isn't one that fair trade certify but i do know someone that's worked with fair trade that would be able to prob would know how to find it this guy called albert tucker who she had worked with and sort of pioneering the fair trade movement around bananas and and chocolate and coffee. He was a coffee trader and a, a, oh, wow. um, a person that's been very much involved in that whole movement. So she introduced us to Albert, and that was really what is what kicked it off. Albert is a native of Sierra Leone. He was over there, and we we found out from him that it was something we could, you know, that, that he could help us source and uh, introduce us to some villages that the brief being we'd need to make sure they benefited from it because we needed to make the karma quite tangible. <laughs> like yeah, yeah. show that we could be accountable for whatever money we put back down that back in that direction, like you know, the paying forward thing. Uh and that, that kind of kicked it off. We you know, Albert was very helpful and we learned a lot in a short time about how to get hold of cola. That's cool. Like it's kind of amazing. Like I've spoken to a couple of people who have kind of got this very like you know social business aspect to what they do, like yourselves, and like on the surface of it, to you know Joe Average, uh, 
you know, setting up a company, selling something, and then giving money back to somebody sounds like it should be incredibly simple, but it's amazing the complexity involved in it by the sounds of things. Well, I think with any modern product, because, you you know, it used to be that if you wanted to start a soft drink company, you had to kind of build a factory. You know, you it was pretty hard to uh, be able to find other suppliers that could help you. So, you know, although it is just a soft drink, and they're pretty common product to make and buy and sell, there's a lot of complexity in making one. You know, you've got to get a bottle, a cap, a label. You know, yeah. in the case of our Kayla Cola, there's like 14 or 16 different ingredients. Then you've got to put them all in one place. These ingredients, in our case, come from all over the world. So if we're going to add this extra layer of being um, environmentally low impact, socially responsible, yeah, yeah. all those choices that you make about what goes into your product, you've got to make three or four more times so you know who are we buying from how are they being paid what what's the impact of on them socially of the purchase you know are we doing the best thing we can ethically with that relationship what's the expectation of the you know waste in production if we're going to say we're we're doing the best thing by the environment can we quantify it you know can we stand up to scrutiny so we look for these third parties like the Fair Trade Association uh, the, uh, and uh, organic um, certifiers to make sure that we're being held, um, I don't know, uh, uh, to that scrutiny and and our, Yeah. But, you, you know, you can't say this stuff without it meaning something. And, it, and like you say, it, it, on the surface, it seems pretty straightforward. But if you really want to stand up for those things, you've got to look pretty deeply into all of those aspects to make sure they do stand up. Yeah. You could maybe, like, you know, especially these days, somebody will find out if there is something to scrutinise about it. It'll, you'll be found out pretty quick these days, I'd imagine. <laughs> oh, I mean, every, information is there for everyone. It's not, yeah. you know, when you get to the nitty-gritty, it can get pretty confusing. Like, there are lots of different ways of doing this. But we've been, you know, recently we've been going through this B Corp assessment thinking, how what's a good holistic way to look at this because you know we do have a lot of um certifications and, and ways of presenting our credentials and it's quite good you know it's quite holistic it looks at the way we operate as a, a responsible organization with our staff at the way we look at our suppliers and the communities that we supply and sell to you know there are some ways of thinking about this that are becoming uh easier because you don't have to do it all yourself anymore it's frankly yeah. like the B Corp thing that works because it's sort of thought through to be universally applicable. And I, I think the world's changing a lot. You know, you know that a Google search will, will uncover quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> stand up to that to start with. But it'll also introduce you to a lot of things too. So there's, I think there's as much help out there for businesses like ours these days as there are obstacles to overcome. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting, like, um, just kind of did a bit of research. Like, I, you know, pretty much everyone in a typically developed country, let's say, grows up with cola or soda drinks all around them from pretty much the word go. It's amazing. And I still, it still kind of freaks me out to think that, you know, in the hierarchy of needs, <laughs> it's important for us as humans, you know, yeah. worshipping a brand that doesn't do much to, for you other than refresh you is kind of weird, right? But it, yeah, yeah, especially, yeah, yeah. especially it's like if it, if it, I mean, if it, like, I don't know, cured you of diseases or, you know, like, it, there's, there's nothing really well, good about well, the, the big, the big brands. It'll give you some energy, right? There's obviously sugar, there's, there's flavor in it. You know, it's a great feeling. And that, that whole cold burst of bubbles that you get from a cola is a really uplifting thing. And I've, My God, I'm hot. salivating right now. Yeah, it's cool, right? <laughs> But, you know, it's not that important. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, like, I read something like yeah. there's, like, over one million colas drank every minute or something like that. Yeah, so, the, I mean, I, again, this is staggering, right? There's shy of two billion cola-branded drinks consumed in the world every day. Now, that's uh, one big company. It doesn't include the other big cola company. And it's yeah. probably all of their beverages. So there's probably water in that as well. But that's, it's still a hell of a lot of liquid in packaging. 
So if you think of it from a, like an environmental point of view, you go, right, My that, God. that stuff that's been taken out of the ground or from the forest, where all the ingredients come, put in some sort of container and shipped to someone to be consumed. That's yeah. phenomenal, right? That's like, that's so much stuff being moved. And yeah, especially when a lot of it is, depending on who you speak to, can be classed as some unhealthy poison. <laughs> you know, or the plastic, you know, packaging that isn't really needed or it's going to end up somewhere else where it becomes a problem for someone else. So yeah. that's the thing about you start taking these sort of high moral ground claims of being good and karma and everything. You know, it's a rod for your back because you really got to think about that whole, you know, what they call the cradle to cradle lifestyle, a uh, life cycle, not lifestyle, sorry, but the <laughs> life cycle. Yes, it does become a lifestyle, but the life cycle is important because you got to know what happens after it leaves your warehouse. You know how? Yeah. If you're going to be selling that much stuff, if you know, if most of it ends up in the ocean, you're not doing a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Like I remember Chris uh, from Keep Cup when he was on the podcast was talking, just said something that's just, you know, like one of these lines that really strikes you when it's just like, you know, if you were truly like economical company or like like you wouldn't make something. Well, he said to me, I, thought this was so <laughs> I hope he doesn't share it. I hope this is okay. So, you know, we were having one, having one of these conversations on a panel and he said, he said publicly, he said, you know, the best thing you can do is just drink your coffee out of a cup at the cafe. Don't take it out. Yeah. Now, now, you know, for someone like Chris to say, you don't actually need my product. <laughs> it's all. Yeah. And we go, well, you know, but that, that is the answer. And he was going, well, it's, you know, it's great that people have convenience and this whole package of drinks thing is about that, that you have the refreshment you want wherever you want it. You know, there's a whole philosophy around the commerce of drinks companies being able to have one of their products at arm's reach to anyone who needs one. Yeah. That's Nirvana if you're in that game, right? Mm. But, but you also go, well, isn't it good just to sit down and enjoy that cup of coffee right next to where it was made by someone who made it for you with that care and take the time to savour it? And, the, you know, that's one of the things that seems to be resonating right now is that now that everyone has to take the time to savour the things they make, like we have dinner here as a family every night. It's been a while since we've done that. You know, we, we, mm. there's those moments that are be, sort of because of our convenience lifestyles become a less precious, perhaps, you know, or something that, that is sort of overlooked because there's alternatives that are a bit faster or more in, in inverted commas convenient. Yeah, yeah. Aren't necessarily good for us, you know. No, like, I think the whole isolation thing, like, I hope, you know, like, this is obviously, I think it's a big, a big lesson for many people for a variety of different reasons, but I think. You know, people use kind of like you say, like people use their life, their job, their hobbies, their work, whatever it may be, as like a distraction from really actually dealing with the kind of stuff going through their head or what's going on at home. And I think this is probably going to be quite a healthy time for people as well. Yeah, I think. I mean, it's it's kind of I I already worry about this because it's partly partly my job to slip into these platitudes, you know, to go. Mm. Although it's shit, it's going to be all right, you know that that we're here to help and I made some posts about that. And, you know, I feel strongly about being responsible as an organization in a time like this and figuring out how to actually be relevant, because like I've said, soft drinks, who actually needs them? You know? Our big challenge is to make them relevant and the relevant yeah. we've made for them is saying it's, it's okay to drink this one because it's actually going to do some good. I mean, it's got sugar and it's like a soft drink. You know that and you love that flavor or taste. But you can rest assured that someone else has benefited from this as well as you. So that gives me confidence that we can sort of tell these stories and and be useful to people because someone is benefiting from it. Yeah. And you think, how do you take that into a world where, you know, all of those um, top of mind choices that are sort of made automatically, like going to a supermarket to buy something, becomes something you dwell on a bit longer. You know, you go, do I really need that? You know, I've got to do my shopping. I'm going to have to carry it because, I, you know, I know that I'm probably not going to get an uh, online delivery as far as I used to. I might have to walk yeah. to get it. A whole bunch of different decisions made. So, you know, for a company like us in that context, you go, well, what, what can we do that isn't venal, that isn't like us exploiting this opportunity? Now, 
it's <laughs> it's very hard for us to exploit it because ninety percent of the customers we have are shut. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I don't feel too bad about you know taking uh, advantage of a situation that you know shouldn't be taken advantage of because we just can't. But you still have to think about your role in all this as an organisation, and I think that's what's what's been. Really- However, though, like, would you would you say you're like you know if you're taking advantage of a situation like this, like with a company like yours that is you know, genuinely making a difference to the people that are even making the ingredients in the farms in Sierra Leone. Like, is that great. taking advantage when you're benefiting other people? Like, yeah. I can understand if Coca-Cola were doing it, but if, you know, like you're doing it and it, the, you know, you, you're directly having an impact in other people's lives, then surely that's not taking advantage. Well, that's just the bug I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, well, the thing is, I come down to this because you do a bit of, you know, soul search. You go. Actually, the more we sell, the more good we do. So, yeah. Okay. We just need to find a way of selling it to people. And it's like talking to you about your day job. You know that. Yeah. When you are dealing with customers that need a hand because they're in the hospitality trade, you know, you kind of have to help them to go. Most of your customers aren't doing what we had expected them to be doing at this time of year, especially for us when coming into spring. It's like when all our sales start. Yeah, of course. You know? You go, so how do we get to them? What's the, the, you know, and how do we help? And then the ecosystem of businesses we work with and you work with, like hospitality outlets, you know, we've got to be useful for them too because they're they're actually our customers. It's them selling to their customers that gets us our money. Yeah. And those are the challenges. Like, right, a lot of them are, you know, terrible cliche, but they're pivoting from selling from their coffee machines or, you know, the restaurants they're in. To doing home deliveries or helping people by cr- providing subscriptions to coffee and things like that, we do mm. go through a lot of coffee outlets because there's a synergy between us having authentic, you know, uh, provenance around our ingredients and you know the sort of third wave of coffee that also have a similar story to tell about provenance. So yeah, of course, that's the crowd we kind of run. With. Awesome. I, I I was uh, reading in a, a few interviews that you've like referred to Karma Cola as a business with a sustainable ethical supply chain and not a charity. Um, could you tell us just a bit about like kind of what you mean by that? So it's um one of the things I was really wary of is that we don't need a lot of cola to make a drink, and to to call ourselves Karma, we in that one product. And we've got a whole range of these things, but in this sort of yeah. original hero product. I knew that if we we knew that if we bought the cola, it still wouldn't be that much money for these guys. It's kind of we probably need to pay them more than the cost of the ingredient just to make right. It. Okay. But then I'm going, well, is that charity? And I'm going, no, it's actually it's trade because I really want this to to be an equitable trading relationship and not one where there's an imbalance. You know, where we appear to be gifting money rather than it being earned. And I think yeah. there's, a, there's a significant difference here, and that's that what we've seen, because we have this, I hope, equitable relationship, and it's something that Albert's very been very good at managing for us and still will, and that's that they understand that when they show benefit from what they've earned uh, going back into the communities, it helps us tell the story to people like, you know, listeners to this podcast. Hmm. And... It, or it means that we're, you know, they're kind of, they're empowered by it. That they're not just holding their hands out and we're not just kind of put, peeling off the, the Leone notes, you know. We're, we're going, we have sold this many drinks. That's worth this much to you. It's a percentage of our revenue that we've dedicated to this fund. Now we need to make sure it's used really well because it's not that much money compared to, say, NGOs working in these sorts of areas. Hmm. So what we've, and then this is a bit of DIY in this. And we, when we started, we went, look, if we're going to show that we are have this karma credibility, we don't know enough about developing, you know, rural economies to be sustainable, to be experts at it. But we shouldn't assume that these guys don't know either. Yeah. <laughs> so let's just ask them. And that was the first kind of, straightforward but but you know in retrospect kind of it's not an orthodox way to do this but this sort of development and 
um, so we said, look, that one of the things that was great about the way it was set up is that we work with a, communi a, a com committee of community leaders that are all fairly democratically chosen in this area, in, in TY, in the Gola Rainforest in Sierra Leone in West Africa. And they wow. come to these decisions themselves and they sort of lobby Albert and Michael, who's uh, Michael Salu, who's our sort of foreman down there, and say, look, we want to do this. We want to you know, can we build a classroom? And in that example, we go, well, we're not in the business of building schools because if we proclaim we are, everyone's going to want a school. And actually, we don't have that much money. Hmm. But if, this, if the, that project was supported by the community and the government, we're happy to be a catalyst for it because then we'll know that it won't be up to us to do the next one, that you'll have to have this really good kind of understanding of who's responsible for the outcome and the local yeah, we have to be responsible the government have to be because you know these are things that governments should be responsible for ultimately yeah. <laughs> so you know let, let's not try and you know be the kind of <laughs> it's a terrible thing but they're like the white savior will come and build this for you and then fuck off sorry <laughs> yeah we'll, no no you're good you know we'll um We'll help you do it, but but oh, there are systems that should be working here. If they're not working, let's be the catalyst to make them work. So that and you know that's kind of worked. We've we've done that a few times, and the weird thing is, because there's ownership of the outcome, they build these things. We don't have to send a, a like a group of people in of construction engineers. Hmm. We just buy the materials and help with the plans and organize them a bit and give them a hand. So it's more like. Um, it's more like turning up to the, you know, you, I don't know, the, the, your family farm or, you know, if you've got a relative who's doing something who's asked you for a hand. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's a bit of a working beat. Now, it's not quite that simple or, or glib, but it is, it is useful to have that sort of on-the-ground relationship where we can go, well, building a bridge is only going to cost us a few thousand dollars because the materials are some of that. The effort, the actual labour, some of the people in the village are going to contribute to. Well, we can we can kind of do it on a budget, and and that's been a real eye opener for me because you think that light touch doesn't just make it less expensive to do, but it means it gets done. But yeah, absolutely. People who are benefiting from it are actually involved in the doing, and you can see the like tangible effect you're you're having, I suppose, on these communities. You know, yeah, and it's kind of some glue too. And not that these people need to need extra community. I mean, they've got great ways of relating to each other. It's good social fabric there, but there is a sense of, of pride and, and a kind of community spirit around these projects, and that's also pretty awesome. Hmm. Uh, how, like, like, have you been out to Sierra Leone yourself, or how often do you get out? Like, what's it like kind of well, down there? The first time I went, it was just, it was completely surreal. Like, Matthew, one of my business partners, and Albert and I went out and it was probably a year since we'd sold the first bottles. Okay. And once we got the, you know, the first recipe worked out and made it and produced the first box, we sent it over there. And, uh, you know, the, the group in the community that received it were kind of, I mean, surprised. And weirdly, a, a, a few years after that, visiting again, one of the, the local village storyteller told this story to the Paramount Chief and a few other people and us who were kind of gathered around this thing about how they got this request from these people on the other side of the world in New Zealand for some cola nuts. I was listening to this thinking, the chronology and the story is a bit wrong, you know, what, what's going on here? And, and yeah. quite critical of it, thinking, well, that's not how it happened. And I thought, no, this is exactly how it happened. You know, he was telling this local mythology now. You know, it was nothing to do with us. It was to do with his view of the world and what mm. happened. And what had happened was these weirdos from the other side of the world asked them. <laughs> and, uh, and then they gave it to them and they didn't hear anything. And that was kind of, they sort of forgot about it, right? They, but they gave us the gift of colonel because they never invoiced us for it. I don't think we ever probably paid for the first shipment. But, you know, we got like five kilograms of colonel, which was, from their perspective, a gift to us, which is great. And then the next thing that arrived was this box of drinks. And that, you know, that's a big gap from, yeah. <laughs> in, you know, both actually in time and everything. It's like, wow, that's what happened. 
the next thing that arrived was money, was this commitment to the karma of paying back for every one of those drinks that he'd sold. Mm. And that was, you know, the next level of surprise for them. And the guy that was helping us manage this, a, a guy called Dr. Hans Peter Müller, who's with uh, Weltunger Health, or a German NGO over there, who sort of helped us, you know, figure out how to do some of these things. He said, and he's a very dry German guy, because he was the one that we sent the check to. He just went, wow. No, like, that's not what we expected. Anyway. <laughs> it sounds like a good wow, though. Oh, yeah, it was great, because he's like, he's, you know, he's, he, he doesn't crack it on. He's a lovely man, but there's a, there's a really kind of dry sense of humor that comes through that Germanic guy who's seen everything. You know, he's been yeah, it's in true. Africa it's most brilliant. of his life. So, and it, so it was it was one of those beautiful moments. You think, yeah, that's great. That's you know that doesn't happen very often. Anyway, um, the the storyteller's kind of going, and then we decided we'd build this bridge. You know, the, the thing that we wanted to do with it was to use the money to join the two parts of this old village, the old and the new village together, and replace a bridge that had probably gone during the civil war and now was just bamboo and got washed away every rainy season. Oh, wow. So, you know, wind back to the first time I went there, having travelled from New Zealand to the UK to Morocco, and then, like, it's a 48-hour journey, and then there's a whole lot of tre trekking through um, the rainforest to get to this place. We finally get there, and there's, um, I mean, it's fantastic, because kind of, Given that we Matt and I have been doing all this travelling, we're sort of being bombarded by all these sensations, amazing lush green rainforest, you know, and, and pretty warm, and um, and this drums beating, and oh, wow. these really beautifully dressed woman that, that had sort of greeted us at the edge of the forest. Um, you know, <laughs> it's a barrage. Of yeah, yeah, clearly dehydrated. <laughs> exactly, you're kind of pinching yourself, going, "What is happening here?" <laughs> and they, you know, they they come up to us and beckoned us down into this track down a, down a hill, uh, sort of into the forest, and um, we saw as the kind of clear. It was firstly these these young men dressed as devils came and danced around us, and they had these really ferocious masks on and they're on stilts and dancing to this drum beat and like it was full on. It was great. It was like being in the circus, you know, but in amazingly green, lush rainforest. And one of them who thought, you know, because we must have looked pretty, I don't know, freaked out, sort of lifted his mask up so he could grin at me <laughs> just to say, it's okay, you know, it's going to be all right. And then they <laughs> carried on and they, they ushered us down and they, the whole village was there, all dressed up on the bridge. Oh, wow. And that was the moment you go, far out. <laughs> you know, Jeez. we did that. Um and never look back, you know, something like that happens, you kind of have to honour it. Must be pretty crazy to, like, you know, be in the middle of a rainforest kind of down there thinking, fuck, this is, like, where we get our stuff from. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, just, like... Well, you think of all those trips you do to and from an airport, right? Where you're going, you're travelling somewhere if you're going to a place like this, and you go past all these warehouses and big containers mm. and trucks and all this the stuff of modern commerce of international trade and you end up in a place like this where someone's got a colon up in their hand <laughs> you know, you go, it's just it's it is i know i'm maybe laboring the point but it did seem pretty mind-boggling you go that's all no, i know i can imagine mm. as well as probably just yeah just what an experience to not only have that moment of been struck by like oh wow like it's literally this is where it happens but also seeing the kind of fruits of the labor of the effect you've had by having everyone on the bridge you know but that's the thing that's the sort of that's the uh what do you call it there's a, there's a word for that sort of imposter syndrome imposter syndrome you're kind of going we just made some drinks you know yeah maybe it wasn't that we did. and then you see what's happening is kind of exponentially cool yeah <laughs> <laughs> I mean, imagine what you could do if you got a bit more organised. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned just like briefly before I asked you that question, like trialing out the kind of first recipe, and just like it just kind of made me think, like, how difficult is it to not just go, 
I want it to taste like Pepsi or Coca Cola. <laughs> like, like, that is the right like, question, Greg, because you go right. What is cola? You know, yeah, cola is a concept, and it's a concept that costs four billion a year. Mm. That's the advertising value. Yeah, probably not this year, but maybe the year before that. Of uh, money spent to talk about cola in the public domain, right? So cola is as much an expectation as a flavour, right? Mm. This is my view of it. When I was a kid in the 70s, um, there were songs about that drink. Yeah. And they were they were great. They were happy songs. You know, they were things that made you feel good. And they, they still sort of resonate for me because I kind of think, well, you make that, that true, that, you know, teaching the world to sing in perfect harmony thing true, it would be awesome. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of the sentiment that came out of the, these big creative campaigns around yeah. around happiness and joy and sharing things, are, um, are in, it sort of influenced your taste buds. And we know that because of the, the challenges between Pepsi and Coke, that, that the one that wins isn't necessarily the one that tastes best because it's so subjective. But if yeah. you want to go into that market, you've got to taste like it. Because otherwise, yeah. you're not cola. That's what sort of permanently tattooed on our taste buds is this idea that's reinforced by the, you know, the many, many times you've drunk the stuff. Mm. So you kind of have to go, what, what, what's an authentic cola flavour? And we basically went, how do we make something that's close to that out of organic ingredients that we recognise? So we went, right, we, we've got the cola nut, we're going to you know, break that down into, it's incredibly bitter, so it's it's a really hard flavour to work with. And cola is, is probably best explained as the tension between all the ingredients. So super bitter cola nut, as soon as you nibble this stuff, and it just takes all the moisture out of your mouth. Oh, wow. So it was probably used in the original recipe as a tonic, as a stimulant. You know, when, you, when they uh, still ritually use it in West Africa, it's a... Uh, it makes you talk to it. You know, it's a it's a really great sharing. You know that whole idea of of sharing friendship with cola is from there. Well, yeah. not of intentionally being from there, but there is it resonates with what happens there because it's that sort of thing. It's for welcoming people. It's used in religious ceremonies. It's also inhibits appetite. So if you're walking through the jungle because there's no public transport and you're going to go a long way, you take cola with you to sort of ward off hunger pain well, and it has a lot of medicinal re, um, properties so it was probably in a tonic you know 150 years ago as a as a pick-me-up and that's why people would tolerate the bitterness they go oh it's medicine oh, it's good but what they wanted to do was make it more palatable so sugar vanilla lemon oil and lemon juice um, and we tried to simulate that what what is a kind of synthesized flavor these days with natural and organic ingredients so we've got lemon juice lime juice citrus uh from oranges and cola the cola flavor is very citrusy you know if you smell a cola you get a lot of that lemon lime right. and orange on the nose um and it's also it's kind of a sharpness in in that first sip when, it, when, it, when it's sort of fizzing out the nose you can get you get that sort of citrusy um, a certain sharpness. Um, and then it has a lot of spice in it. It's got cinnamon, nutmeg. Uh, yeah, yeah. And so all those things make it rounder and sort of warmer and um, and spicier, you know, but, but but richer. And then one of the things that other companies use is a burnt sugar colouring, and we didn't want to do that. So we have a, um, a malted, a, a roast barley malt um, extract, which is organic, which gives it its colour and it's a, a little bit of flavour. It's a little bit um, slightly savoury, I think. It's sort of an umami flavour in there, which sort of rounds out the um, the the, uh, the lemony sort of citrus flavours. Mm. The, the trick with one of these is that they are sweet, and one of the great things <laughs> I know it's probably doesn't sound so great. One of the great things about these more familiar recipes, so they use things like phosphoric acid, which is probably not a good thing to put in a drink. But No, it what, doesn't sound like it. What it does is when you have that first hit, which is quite sweet, you can't, you don't really want it to carry on all the way to the back of your mouth being that sweet. So the acid 
and we've replaced this with lemon juice. We just use lemon juice to do it. Cuts through the sweetness. And it means you can take the next sip because otherwise ah. it's too sweet. So you need to get that balance. And it, it's the, I mean, there's some science in that. And I'm sure there's food technologists that can talk much more eloquently about it. But, you know, you really want to be able to get that hit of sharp, sweet fizz on the front of your tongue. But as you gulp a big swig of it the first time you drink it, you don't want it to be so cloying that it makes you choke. Sweet drinks do that. So you yeah. need that sort of acid to, to cut through the sweetness. And you get that experience right, and that's what makes it delicious. Because, you, you know, a hot day, you're, uh, you know, you, I don't know, been working or running or you're out on the beach and you open a cold can and you get that effervescent hit. It's, there's nothing better. Mm -hmm. You're making me like salivate. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm wishing it is that time at the moment, isn't it? It's like, <laughs> um, funny how kind happy of... hour creeps a bit forward when you're on lockdown. What's the sorry? But happy hour keeps creeping forward when we're on lockdown. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Well, we we don't have happy hours in Scotland, so <laughs> uh, we can't be trusted. Evidently, <laughs> they're they're not allowed to discount alcohol in Scotland for obvious reasons. <laughs> Um, kind of going back to your branding, which is like one of the things, you know, many things to love about your brand, but this is one of the things that personally I love being a designer, uh, is that what I do love is that they all, they all differ, like, you know, from the ginger ale to the karma cola, uh, they all differ and are individually distinctive, but you can kind of tell they're all part of the same family. Um, do you have like a particular, or did you have like a particular philosophy when it came to the kind of branding and design of the Karma Cola products that you wanted to achieve? Or was it just kind of, oh, I really like this and just kind of see where it took you? I'd love to answer that with yes, that we were very strategic about it. But actually, <laughs> we did one. We did the we did the cola. And the thing that drove that, the look and the, the style of the label was um, was thinking about the place it came from and just knowing that we needed to differentiate that you know we, we had to have something that was going to catch people's attention in a way that was delighting them because the you know just the name in itself for me probably wasn't enough uh as the the sort of most dramatic aspect of the label it felt like that would be a bit like all the others yeah um we looked at i worked with a group called special in auckland friends of ours who had helped us with the former business and I'd had a crack myself and I just wasn't that excited with the with the output I, I tried to turn the cola nut into something sort of anthropomorphic you know like a smiling shape oh. and tried to turn the type and karma cola into something you know with personality but it just felt a bit too cute so I was talking to Heath and Emma at Special, and they said, let, let, let us come back to you with some ideas. And they basically put together some really interesting research, and we looked at a whole lot of pictures. And, and amongst them were a couple of things that really, really took me. One was a kind of Mexican retablo votive painting where you have these everyday miracles, like someone, you know, falling off a horse and, you know, not dying. And yeah. and uh, and they they asked one of these retablo painters to paint a little votive offering to the Lady of Guadalupe, and it'll be the miracle of not dying off the horse or whatever. But there was one that had a an angel um, flying around a devil in this sort of circle, and I thought, you know, that that's karma, right? That the good and the bad thing is actually a lot more exciting than just being good. You know, and there was something in the idea of this is a soft drink, right? Inherently, it's just a soft drink. But if we can do some good with it, we turn this commodity into a force of good, which was a bit, you know, probably over laboring it a bit. But you're kind of thinking, how do you get that dynamic in this, that it's good because it's not bad? And the the angel devil thing worked really well. And then we were thinking there's actually a story. And, and Beck, who illustrated the the label really got deeply into this because as soon as we sort of talked to we first sorry i'll backtrack a little bit the other no no you go. the other thing i saw was this great thing it was like a snake eating its tail with what goes around comes around it was so rock and roll i thought you know that's kind of cool that we can have that attitude and that 
what goes around comes around is what this is about. But it's a positive spin on that one. So, mm. so I think maybe we can be a bit edgy with this. You know, for the first illustrator, we got to look at the whole thing. Gave us this really gothic expression, and it was awesome. But you knew it wouldn't sell a drink. It looked great. <laughs> it looked great tattooed, <laughs> but it wasn't quite warm enough or folk, folksy enough. So, and, that, and then I thought, oh, this is hard, you know. It's how do we get to this point where it's kind of attractive uh, and the idea isn't, over, isn't sort of overshadowing just the beauty of the thing or the, the simplicity of the thing. And um, we knew this woman, Beck Wheeler, who'd worked with us on our banana business. And I mean, James, who works with us, said, why don't we just give it to Beck? Thought, yeah, that's a great idea. Like, let's get someone else to interpret it, who we know, so we can spend a lot more time Instead of having, you know, this illustrator was in the, in the States, I think, we can mm. work through it. Because what I thought we felt, felt like I needed to do anyway is with Heath and Emma and Beck was just, this is going to work, but we, there is some craft in this and we really need a, like a relationship that will let us get there. Beck was amazing and she did a lot of drawings. In fact, today I've been going through them because we've got a, a new marketing person starting with us and I wanted to give her the sort of backstory so she's got the oh, nice. we use. And, I mean, this is like eight, eight, nine years ago now, but the drawings are still really great. And you can kind of see the process we went through to get to something that was, I mean, it's not the most simple label, but it is an, an interpretation of a West African deity who's also good and bad. She's called Mummy Water. <laughs> and Mummy Water lives, you know, in, the, in the, her spirit lives amongst the villages we work with. So the serendipity was, while we were looking at this stuff, we were learning about the culture of the place it came from. Uh, and this mashup was just beautifully synchronized because Mami Wata is like a mermaid and she brings good fortune and bad fortune, depending on how you treat her or you treat the land. Uh, and she's the reason that the last six chiefs of the village that we principally trade with have been a woman because they're like the embodiment of the spirit. So this thing was getting kind of a bit weird because it was so kind of close to what we were trying to do and great. Yeah. Bit. But Beck really beautifully dug deep into that, the sort of artifacts of the, the sort of folk style of the place. And that's where that, that character on the front came from, or the two oh, wow. of the character. So we've got this heavily illustrated bottle that's kind of dense in story. But just looks great. So, you know, there was enough in it to be visually delightful uh, and not overcomplicated, and that's what set us going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was kind of labouring again, but it, it felt like it was a great artefact. And and seeing it now after so long, it's still, you know, it's been the the bottles and the cans we've done have been through a few different iterations, but it still holds together. Yeah, no, it looks great. The next, like what an incredible story as well. Yeah, and it's like that's the thing you can't put on a back of a bottle. You know, it's kind of we have we've got <laughs> there's a lot of stories to tell, but you know, they, what is it they say that you've got about point three seconds to get someone's attention on the shelf. <laughs> so trying to condense all that just it meant that there was a lot to reveal, I suppose, over time. And one of the great things about the way we do this is that people who are interested can find out more. You know? Well, it's like one of these cans and bottles that, you know, you kind of find a new gem in it. Every Like when you're sitting, you know, just, you know, yeah. whether it's at a party or whether it's in your back garden in the sun, just like twirling the can in your hand, you kind of discover new bits each time. It's really great. Yeah, and there's enough of that detail. I think, I mean, that's, that, that's what happened the next one. You know, we, we kind of thought we'd do the same thing again. We'd ask Beck to draw because the, Ginger Ella was the next product we did, and this is where my favorite. Yeah, and, and that, it's, such a, it's such a great flavor, and ginger is such a great thing. But we tried to do the same thing and go. We're getting this from this time from Sri Lanka. Maybe we can use something that's uh, you know relevant culturally there that'll connect the place to the people that are buying it. So we looked at all sorts of sort of funny interpretations of Sri Lankan things like tigers and monkeys and. Beck did, again, I looked through these drawings and I didn't, Beck did a great job of all this crazy stuff, but it just looked a bit like we were trying to be like the other one. 
which mm. is kind of what we're trying to do. But it, it, it somehow made the Kohler thing look less impressive because there was this other one that was trying to be like it next to it, if that makes sense. <laughs> so you go, can you, does this, this way of doing it actually translate to a range of products? And it, it was feeling a bit wrong. So the thing about it, and we're also thinking of the name, and Raha, who was working with us, went, why don't, have you thought of Gingerella? It just, I just love the name. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. What a great thing to call a drink. You know, you kind of already know that it's this probably sassy, um, you know, Cinderella, Barbarella. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's and, so funny. And kind of go, well, maybe that's it. You know, that, and that that really changes it. You kind of go, well, that doesn't look anything like anything we've drawn. What does Gingerella look like? And that's what set the next kind of journey off. We went, right. And I, I rang back and said, look, I mean, the, the colour thing's great, but I think we're going to need to do this differently. And I, I wanted to, to, to work with a different illustrator for it. And she understood. So we talked to another friend who's really good at the kind of illustration that Ginger Ella became. And he, again, it was sort of like a casting thing. We kind of went through, she, you know, she, um, does, what's her hair like? You know, what's her, what sort of, yeah. Go up? Does she, is she the Mona Lisa? You know, is she, is she Jane Fonda? You know, how can how do you make the enigma work? You know, Oh, must have been such a fun design process. Well, it was amazing because we basically cast hairstyle. You know, I mean, is it Jimi Hendrix Fro or is it Gene Shrimpton, you know, lying back in a David Payne yeah. with a hair flying around like like um, Medusa's, you know. So, and that's where it came from. In, in the end, the model was kind of like Gene Shrimpton, you know, this, mm. you know, wonderful hair. <laughs> and <laughs> one of the things that came through was this, at the same time, there are a lot of ginger drinks in New Zealand that were being traded on by kind of taking the mickey out of red-headed people. Right, okay. And there was a bit of flack for it too. And, and it was kind of going, well, yeah, maybe maybe this is bullying. <laughs> 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 we go, well, you know, let's just make it a great thing. Like red hair is awesome. <laughs> so that was kind of what it was about, that there's this, there's this sort of duality to it where, this character is like Mother Nature with a makeover. Like ginger is such a great kind of healthy ingredient that, mm. that comes from, but we've sort of modernised this this happy idea. And the other thing is that she's absolutely standing up for for this weird, like redheadedness could almost be sort of acceptable racism. So she's basically just <laughs> thanks for any minority, you know. And that really, that's awesome. People, you know, we didn't really put it out there, but we found people with tattoos and oh my god and, that's amazing embracing this character and you know she's been on several women's marches she's sort of a she's like you know the great thing about this is that the characters especially the gingerella because as soon as they became more human like even lemmy the the sort of yeah like the lemon um the there was even more identification with the characters from social media and people wanting posters or Oh wow! Artwork they could tattoo. A gingerella poster would be fucking ace. Awesome. Oh yeah, I've got. Oh, I'll send you one. I mean, there's there are a bunch of these things, and that's one of the, one of my challenges that we should be doing. This is why I love that uh, interview with Aaron, like the rising mm. king of the world. Yeah, <laughs> it's just we, we should be doing some merch because there's so much potential there. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Wow, like it's like. So much kind of story behind that. I love it. Yeah, and then Lemmy, you know, he's uh we thought, well, lemons aren't supposed to be lucky, so we'll make a lucky one. <laughs> and he's uh you know, he's sort of the cool things about him is that like the casting uh sessions for Lemmy were long. You know, M Matt Campbell who drew him must have drawn about fifty of them. Like <laughs> you know, looks too creepy, you know, looks too too out of it, you know, looks too happy. Until we got to, you know, this kind of another slightly enigmatic whistling lemon. And then it was like, what's he listening to? You know, what's going on in his head? So, again, this stuff that the universe has thrown back with, to us is, you know, people coming up with the songs that Lemmy's listening, whistling. And, oh, wow. And, That's awesome. Yeah, and more, a few more tattoos. Um, 
Yeah. What's it like to see like you know your brand tattooed on somebody? Oh, it's pretty worrying at first, and then you because <laughs> some of them aren't that great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's funny. I met this guy who was marketing. Uh, is it Strongbow Cider? And Strongbow mm. had this weird phenomenon of people just wanting that archer on their arms. And so they got a tattooist to do it. He said, turn up and we'll tattoo it on you. I thought, well, oh, that's ballsy. Like, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure I, I feel good about hiring a tattooist to start tattooing lemony on people. But if they wanted to, I think I'd let them, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so you kind of think, well, you know, the people have identification with these things. They're not really ours anymore. And that's what's so great, you know. That- that's like the best, best kind of design, you know, when people kind of take it and do their own thing with it and kind of create this persona around them. Well, I think it's it's that ad- ad- adaptation or adoption of things because you you know they help you tell your story for whatever reason, and you can read anything into it you want. But what I do like about it is that they they've been they have a life beyond what we made them for. And, hmm. I, you know, I don't mind if they're connected back or not. I'm just kind of, you know, part of me is quite excited about the idea that, you know, someone likes them, you know, and, and is, wants to do something with them. And and there's that also that kind of outsourced creativity that being some material for someone else's expression is quite cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I also loved uh, your Black Friday thing that you did, the 0% off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that was a great campaign. Yeah, it's a, like we got so many little ones like that. We did, the, you know, one of the things about Ginger Ella is that that style can be reinterpreted. So mm. we, um, we did a Ginger Fella for the Royal Wedding, the most recent one. Ah, brilliant! And uh, there is out, out there in the um, on the internet pictures of bottles that we produced of Ginger Fowler, which is ha- Harry in the same style. It went ballistic, like it was. Oh wow! Well, we didn't sell them, but we made some so we could. We have been supporting this thing called Redhead Day, which is like a pro redhead campaign, and this wonderful woman. Um, Emma Kelly had, had sort of championed it and it's been her baby for a long time and she's been absolutely amazing. She got in touch with us once, probably six years ago, and said, uh, really love your ginger ale. I have this blog called Ginger Parrot. Um, I'd, <laughs> like, I'd like to, you know, I'd like to, to tell a story about you. And I said, well, of course, you know, here's some product. And then we discovered she had did these things every year called Redhead Day, so we got some stock for her for that. And then Redhead Day, it turned out, was going to be on exactly the same day as the Royal Wedding. Ah, oh, wow. So we celebrated with her and our friends at Kessel's Kramer and came up with some of this stuff and had the oh, wow. fantastic day of, you know, uh, making these gingerella masks of Harry. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. That's awesome. And, uh, yeah, it was awesome. It was great. And it's things like that that there's sort of uh, there's something in the DNA of what we do that just allows us to play. It's it's also it's not the most straightforward thing to really campaign from a kind of serious advertising perspective, <laughs> but it is quite great to do these campaigns because the spontaneity of those ideas capture other people and they want to be yeah. involved. So, like our thing is, if you can, if we can, like with we do with the foundation, if we can engage people who are just excited about doing stuff with us, that's great, and that's probably an easier way for us to get noticed than buying their attention like earning yeah earning precisely yeah. Of hard work is is so much more enjoyable yeah absolutely it seems uh well i i say past few years um, I could, it, but my timing could always be off maybe like three to five years that there has been like a surge in kind of independent drinks companies you know people like alternatives to the big brands like you know the 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 cola coca-cola brands or the pepsi family brands or whoever like you know yourself like i'm also a big fan of like ugly water and stuff and things like that like where do you think the surge in the popularity in these independent drinks brands has come from like what is drawing people to these brands over the big name brands um i think there's two things one is just a shift in manufacturing technologies and 
the ability for people to do these things without large amounts of capital. So like the guys at Ugly, who we know, and some other Dash, um, Nick's Picks, mm. there's a bunch of um, you know people I guess we run with who've been at it for a similar amount of time who've discovered that they can get co-packers to help them make stuff, that they can do it to start with, they can sort of bootstrap their businesses without vast amounts of investment, that you can kind of get a little niche for yourself and then build on it and having confidence to do that. And some of these people come from, uh, how do you say, probably some more experience in FMCGs too, to, to know that it's possible to do it. They've got a, they've got a few tricks up their sleeves. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, some are just incredibly motivated. Um, uh, there's a woman called, let me get this right, Laura, who has um, a kombucha brand who I meet occasionally. She's done a great job with LA Kombucha of making a really authentic product. And, you know, she has a little brewery. It's growing. She's got some backers now. But, you know, there's a group of people like that that have a really strong idea about their product and the quality of their product and the market that they're trying to get it to who've navigated through all these obstacles and, that we mm. did before, like how do you make a supply chain work? Um, and I think uh, stories like that really help you find great people to work with too. You know, part the, the people you work with really help. So, you know, I'm lucky that my partners have got a lot of experience too. And, and now, we, you know, there's probably 35 people that work with us around the world. So, you know, we've got a good team that help yeah. possible. But there is a point, you know, it's possible to do this stuff now without, like I said before, owning a factory because you can convince people to to pack for you and there's mm. ways of, um, of organising supply and managing operations and if you've got a, a, a way of getting to market and you can kind of sell small volumes to build the volume up enough to, to, to be confident to produce more. And then you get to a certain stage where you need more capital. And if you've got, if you've shown you can do it, if you've got a track record, then, you know, there are people interested in supporting you. So most of those businesses have been through those phases. Yeah. And I, and I, like I say, you know, anyone can kind of make anything. I know it's a bold statement, but the, the way, you know, the complexity around manufacturing has been simplified because those supply chains are, have enormous amounts of technology around them that give you access. So yeah, sure. You, know, you can get on the internet and find the buyers. You can. Well, it's, it that gets, you know, technically speaking, I'm oversimplifying it, but it gets easier every day. Like it's never going to get harder. No, I think when you see, you know, I what did I see the other day? It's when you can kind of, all right. So a, a promotional box, like I was saying, I might need a special box to do a, a thing with. I found an, a, a guy who I work with uh, sent me a link to an online service where you basically give them the dimensions, the artwork, and they'll post it to you. So years ago, I had to cut the piece of cardboard out to figure out how it was going to be made, hmm. get someone else to look at that, and a cardboard engineer would kind of figure it out, and then you'd go through three or four different prototypes. And then you'd have to get a different printer to put something on it. And it was, you know, and not straightforward. It was basically a web service to make a yeah. box. You go, well, you know, I could do that online. Or yeah. Like printing, or you can get 20 books made. <laughs> yeah, well, like, you oh, know, we, we we recently were doing our wedding invites. Yeah. Uh, and, like, just, like, you know, Moo.com. Like, you know, back in, back in the day, to get, like, embossed gold foiling, yeah. all these, like, kind of fancy effects, like, you have to go to, like, you know, you know, a a pretty big printing press company or whatever to do to get all these things. Yeah, yeah. However, now if you if you know your way around a uh, InDesign or an Illustrator, you're quids in, and the like. You'd look at our invites and think we went and got them done somewhere fancy, but just Moo dot com. Yeah, I went from looking for printers that could do as good a job but less for us to thinking, you know what, the time we save using Moo is great, and we can set up everything. We, we did basically the same thing. Right, that's that solves a whole lot of hassle for us just to have. And I'm, I mean, it worries me because I really love because I kind of grew up in that world, the smell of printing ink and the craft of doing things by hand. 
But when it comes to getting stuff done on time, there's there's some really good solutions out there. Yeah. Mm. Now, it probably goes without saying that, you know, the current COVID-19 situation has hit business all around the world incredibly hard. Um, and you, you kind of, like, uh, you know, hit it towards it earlier. Like, you know, you've kind of put some posts out there, which are, like, I found incredibly inspiring posts and positive posts about kind of keep karma and carry on and trying to be that positive influence in a time where it doesn't sound too positive. Uh, and like without prying too much, like it just how much has the kind of pandemic affected karma drinks? Well, you know, I'd be, it'd be an understatement to say we're okay. You know, like anyone else in the world we're in at the moment, things have changed so radically. It's really yeah. to know just how bad it is. But it's also difficult to know just how good it could be. So, I'm in this kind of personal and professional quandary where I go, the opportunity to have a bit of time isn't a bad thing. You know, it's kind of, I've been writing this post today. It's Earth Day tomorrow. One of the people I work with reminded me that a few years ago, he wrote a piece about a book by Rachel Carson called The Silent Spring. Hmm. And the quote was that um, the only, the thing that, um, she, her thesis is that the mechanization of agriculture has ruined the ecology of farms. And because of it, there are no bugs in the hedgerows because there's a use of pesticide is so prevalent. And because of that, there's no bird sound. So this title, Silent Spring, is about the absence of wildlife because of All right. things. It's a, it's a seminal organic movement book. It sort of kicked off that movement. Now, I'm just having a find it. The interesting thing was she, um, she said this thing uh, it was basically given time, life adjusts and a balance is reached. And time is the essential ingredient to learning from nature and letting nature rebalance itself. Now, her scale hmm. of time was a long time. But she said, in the modern world, there's no time. And that's the problem we have. We don't learn from us because we don't take a breath. We are consuming and producing at such a high rate that we really just can't press pause but that's been forced on us now and the pressing pause is what i think is something to really relish and do something with yeah and the thing absolutely. we shouldn't do is race back into doing exactly what we have been doing and i'm sure this is the the kind of meme that is the meta meme at the moment is you know now we've got time what are we going to do with it yeah <laughs> and uh, you know that that that's makes me hopeful what pessimistically our sales dropped off a cliff, you know, in hmm. a week of this going from being a problem that wasn't local to one that was, you know. And even though in the ensuing months we'd been aware of what was going on around the world, you know, there was a, a frenzy of, oh, is this actually going to happen to us? Which I think everyone in the UK or anyone on one this side of the world went through to, oh, it actually is. <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah. And then, uh, you know, what I guess having raced, raced around and looked at furloughing and looked at COBILs and tried to figure out how long we'll be in this lockdown and how much we'll need and how we'll be relevant and useful to our customers and all those things. The, the, the place I'm at now anyway is that, you know, the pause button is definitely pressed. What do we do with the time we've got? And for us, it's we've got to get online. We've got to do digital better. We need to be able to replace the occasions that people used to consume our products in with ones that are accessible now. So that's, you know, online deliveries, things like that. You've got mm -hmm. to think about how those people that we really still want to be our customers will be in, you know, three months or however long it get, takes to get back to a more public life. Um, and, you know, what's the what's the environment we operate in going to be like then? And I, I don't think it'll ever come back to what it was. I think we've, you know, on a, from a pragmatic point of view, we're saying we'll be lucky to see sales back to 70% of what they were, but we might see them grow in other channels. Um, you know, we like to think that our ambitions to be able to export to other markets, to be selling in Europe and places like that could still happen. But, you know, all of that's on hold at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting, like, you know, 
I like I fair enough. It's still it's obviously still fresh because you know we've been in lockdown for however many weeks, so it's by no means going to happen soon. But I do, I'm I always try and remain optimistic, and I do genuinely believe that in times like this, in the same way of like you know the amount of interesting innovative businesses or just different channels of whatever you know even like in a you know crowdfunded solutions to problems or whatever it may be that happened in 2008 that will happen here like i think like during time of you know dire straits and when things are in the shitter like that's when some really great thinking and some really radical thinking from pretty creative people tends to happen the thing you know? i remember from when i studied as a kid is tennessee williams the writer playwright said there's never any creativity without impre- oppression you know? so hmm. what does that mean does that mean you have to be abused as a kid you know what does that oppression mean and then it's i kind of think it's actually pressure you know that this whole idea of needing to have the perfect context to do good creative work in is a bit of a misnomer for me because i think having this external pressure really forces you to, to adapt and it's adaptation that is the, the challenge for us you know i've been listening to these business or listening in on you know these zoom lectures and mm. forums lately to try and get a handle on this with some of the consultants that we work with and other things that i'm lucky enough to be engaged with and there's there's this theme of you know reacting you know first the sort of panic of scrambling and then the the how do you how do you uh, react? And then how do you become resilient? You know, the, the next thing is building resilience in your organisation is everything because this is going to it's like the muscle memory everyone absolutely needs is to be able to do well when they yeah of course I mean from an organisation point of view and you know we've we've got some challenges because we've made some changes recently we've just got a new CEO on board who's amazing but he's probably had the most unusual first 60 days of any ceo can <laughs> <laughs> probably imagine yeah i mean he's gone from wow great company really looking forward to this to shit <laughs> yeah you know, we were selling stuff last week we're not this week you know so and then there's a whole lot of organizational changes that we plan that he's got to implement while you like you said things are going down the shit so it's a it's a fascinating and it's you know not without its challenges time but it's um uh you know not to be too convoluted but it it is it is kind of energizing i think something will come out of this and it has to be good because if it's not we just won't survive (laughs) yeah yeah precisely you know like i think you know many companies will probably see a bit of a paradigm shift in how people you know you know, even how people discover, how people choose, how people buy, how people interact with your brands kind of from here in will be pretty different to how it was before. Like, yeah, some of it will revert back. But I think, you know, there is always opportunity there to kind of pursue somewhere. It just like it might not be the same as it was before or as simple as it was before. But, you know, it will I, still create opportunity. It'll be interesting to see what bounces back. I mean, it's still really hard to make these predictions because it's, you know, this is not something we've done ever been through on this scale before. Yeah. You know, because, you know, things haven't been as commercially complex in the world as they are right now, even though there may have been pandemics uh, in parts of the world before. Like, we've already been in some way through one in Sierra Leone with Ebola. Mm. And what happened there is kind of inspiring you know one of the things that came out of that to go back to where we started about how we operate in that country is that when that calamity struck some woman came we we first went shit you know that was six months after that story about the bridge and mm. we made friends with these people and we, we had a strong relationship both commercially and kind of personally with them and all of a sudden, our friends over there were had their lives threatened by something that was like a horror movie, you know? Yeah. And we kind of went, right, right, we've got some money. What do you want to do with it? <laughs> what can we do? How can we be helped? You know, the first thing you want to do is we want to help. You know, we want to help. Like, how can you be helpful is a really interesting question because it's not that straightforward. Yeah, of course. See, so they really kind of calmly came back and it's like, it's okay, we've been through this shit before. It's not great. 
but this is Sierra Leone, right? In Sierra Leone, if something's going well, most people worry that something's about to not go well. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. So, so they said, or they, they, the chiefs said, look, don't stop what you're doing, which was code for anyone else who's helped us like you have as an external intervention in the past hasn't stayed the distance. So don't mm-hmm. go away. You know, and it was pretty good. I mean, they weren't kind of that casual about it, but they said, no, just keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. It was a really good lesson. Keep doing what you're doing. And then we said, well, great. So we will, right? And the, But the next thing yeah. was, okay, we've got some money. We're going to help. We've got Albert Scott family that work in medicine here and how can we connect some resources we know about and some other money we can get and get you in some investment for education for what they call sensitization, which is basically teaching people hygiene, uh, some basic essentials like, you know, disinfectant and scrubs and the sorts of things we're seeing we need to provide for people here now. So we did that. But the most amazing thing that happened was a few weeks later, a few women from the village we principally trade with in Boma came to Michael, uh, the foreman over there, and said, look, could we borrow some money? because we'd like to be able to go to the market town that's closest to the village to get grocery staples like salt and dried fish and flour and things that they couldn't get from growing in their own little farm Mm. or having stored supply. Because the chiefs had quite cleverly quarantined all of these villages. And so we said, of course, (laughs) what a great idea. So we basically lent the money to hire motorbikes so they could go and follow all the protocols to be able to bring these grocery goods back to the villages. And they set up little shops outside their houses or their huts. And this was our first kind of entrepreneurial loan, you could call it. I mean, it was basically yeah. money in a tin. But it started this thing because after that, There were others that came and said, can we make a loan? And we said, yeah, here's the loan, here's the deal, because they had to pay the loans back. And it became a microfinancing scheme and a kind of local bank. And it really went away. Now, we probably paid the first 20 to 30 of those um, from money directly from the fund. And that money has been recycled and used another three times. So there's of these women entrepreneurs that have gone off to set up shops and other bits and pieces and they are you know they're earning an income they've become financially independent through these loans so that first we go wow that just happened you know we didn't have to do a lot for that to happen that was the kind of karma of just making it available and them doing it and bringing it back but the last time i was over there i spoke to one of the second or third generation of these recipients of these loans this very young, like 18, 19 year old um, entrepreneur. And she said, I've been able to save some money. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Like, and and she, so I could loan it to my neighbor. So, well, you know, what do you loan it for? She said, So he could go to hospital. I'm like, what? <laughs> so, so, one of the things that I notice when we go there is that Albert and I, or whoever else we're with, is often petitioned by people saying, My eyes are bad because, you know, eye problems have got hyper. Mm. Uh, sorry, glaucoma is a problem over there. Or I've got a very sore abdomen and my hernias amongst middle-aged men are very common there because they work so hard and they you know, have these sorts of body failings. And you'd kind of go, well, we can't, I can't make an exception as much as I want to. We, or what we were wrestling with was how could we create a kind of medical support system? Like, do we have to build a hospital? Because we don't, definitely don't have that amount of money or train some people to be nurses or get act. Mm. And we were just trying to figure it out because it just kept happening. You go, okay, I really, and we had Hindua, one of the chiefs that we've become very close to, had a terrible um, uh, uh, kind of turn and we weren't quite sure what it was. So we ended up helping him get to hospital because I just didn't really want him to be so unwell. And, yeah, exactly. Well, how do we do this in a way that is because one of our rules is it's got to be for the whole community, without appearing to to be giving favours. But but um, Amy had solved the problem. She'd gone. I lent some money to someone so they could get to hospital. Well, you know, that's 
wow. at social health. So we said, look, just wait a minute. We're going to try and do this. We'll put money aside like we did with these loans. And anyone who needs to get to hospital can borrow it. And they, if they can pay it back, great. If they can't, we're not going to hassle them about it. But what we need yeah. to make sure is that people who need access to medical health, medical help, can get it. It's pretty simple because we don't have to build a hospital then. There's a hospital 30 kilometers away. We just got to get them to it. So that, mm. that's the answer, right? So we go, okay, let's test this. And Rachel and Albert, Rachel who manages our foundation and Albert, figured out that they could make someone in each of these communities responsible for that. And there was some, some theater around this because one of the things we're always very sensitive to is that if we give the money to a chief, there's some um, kind of stereotypical, not always valid um, assumption that money won't get down to the people who need it. So right. We have to get around the idea of corruption. It's not really corruption. It's just there's different ways of doing things there. But what we wanted to do was empower someone in the community to be the person responsible for this. So they very cleverly uh, had this ceremony in Sahum, I think, or one of the villages we work with where the chief ceremoniously gave this money or you know the token of this money to the person in the village who was going to be the sort of health officer who was going to manage the purse spring string so that anyone that needed it could come to that person and ask for the access you know and that way in an emergency if someone needed to get to the hospital or whatever other medical help we were going to supply or enable it had happened and it's been happening now at that ceremony there was a guy there who got up at the end and said I just want to thank you for all the people who aren't here. And you go, well, that's pretty strange. Wow. What's that about? <laughs> he says, there are people that aren't here that would have been here if this had been in place. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is there are people here who've lent money to loan sharks to be a or borrowed money, sorry, from loan sharks to be able to do what you're enabling that aren't here anymore because they're working in the city to pay them off. Jesus. And then you go, what? Like this is stuff you just don't know about until you yeah. engage in these things. And I mean, the beginning of this story was what comes out of a terrible situation. You know, that mm. that started with the need to respond to Ebola. And it's become yes. incredibly creative or, or or value creating both socially and economically and, and humanly. That's brilliant. Like what a beautiful story and like a perfect example of what could come post COVID-19 as well but uh, thank you very much for your time I, I'm very aware that I've we've gone over what I said we would go over <laughs> but like uh, Simon it's been an absolute pleasure uh, having you on the show and uh, what better way to wrap up than a beautiful story like that hey thanks Gregor great to talk to you and um, you know please uh, feel free to to get in touch any time. Uh, I will do. Well, when this is all said and done, we can actually have a catch-up face-to-face yeah, rather yeah. than... <laughs> and a cola with you in, in sunny Scotland. This yeah, precisely. Precisely. Like, where can people grab themselves some Karma Cola and uh, help support you guys at the moment? Best place to go at the moment is Amazon. Um, we've just kind nice. of restocked our shop there, so just uh, Google uh, Amazon search. Also, Waitrose and Ocado have us online, um, and we'll be launching other online services soon. So follow us on Instagram, just Karma Drinks or Karma Cola, um, and uh, just keep in touch. That way, we'll we'll be pushing stuff out as 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 it comes to hand. Sweet, I'll be getting on that as soon as possible and stocking up my fridge as well. Don't worry. Hey, thanks, Gregor, and um, um, have a nice lockdown. Uh, I'm sure I will. Uh, it's uh, sunny in sunny Scotland for a change, so can't complain during the lockdown. If you're stuck at good, if you're going to be stuck at home and in your garden, it may as well be sunny. So yeah. So yeah. So to wrap up, folks, remember to hit uh, up your favorite podcast platform and hit the subscribe button, and that'll make sure you get notified when a new episode goes up. And as always, if you are enjoying the show, hit the stars, leave a review, share the show with your friends. You have no idea how much it helps grow the show. And as always, please get in touch. Um, we're always keen to hear from everyone, whether it's a question, a guest suggestion, whatever it may be. Ping me an email on methodinthepodcast at gmail.com. That's it from us here. 
Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you found some method in the madness.